Well, hey, welcome everyone uh, all to our Chapel Street Church family. Whether you are been part of our church family for a long time or you're just tuning in for the very first time, we're so glad you're with us. Welcome. You're invited to explore God's Word together with us as we discover what it means to follow Jesus. We just finished a series uh, on biblical justice for four weeks. And four weeks before that, we were in a series on Sabbath and the meaning of rest in our lives. Sometimes here at Chapel Street, we preach a series on specific topics from the Bible, and sometimes we preach on specific books of the Bible. But we always try to preach, uh, strive to be biblical in our approach. And that doesn't just mean that we quote the Bible or we refer to it occasionally. What it means is that we anchor uh, what we're preaching about in the text of Scripture, and we seek to understand the Bible first in its original historical context before we jump right to understanding what it means for us in our context and in our personal lives. So today, we begin a brand new series on the letter of 1 Peter in the New Testament. I always get really excited when we start a new series. I know I always say that, but it's true. It feels to me like, uh, like starting out on a road trip together. You're excited about where you're going to go and the things you'll experience, and, and, um, and if you love road trips, maybe you have that excitement. Or if you don't like road trips, maybe starting a new book and you're just getting into the story and you're excited. So I feel that way, like we're launching out on a journey together. Hopefully you'll join us for this journey, and I think about all that God will teach us and do in us individually and collectively as we journey through this letter of 1 Peter together. So if you're ready to begin the journey, let's jump in. I'm going to read 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles in the dispersion in Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Okay, wow. There is so much in this passage. We really could spend weeks on these verses alone. Uh, but first, we have a memory verse challenge throughout this whole series. Maybe you've never memorized the Bible before, or any part of the Bible, or any verses, or maybe you have, but regardless, we're going to challenge our whole church family, online or in person, to memorize 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Here it is. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us the new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Say that to yourself over and over again. Write it down on a little card. Put it on your bathroom mirror or in your car where you'll see it. Record yourself saying it. When you see friends that are part of the church family, challenge each other to recite it. But get the truths of these words into your mind and into your heart as we go through this series together. All right. One of my first reactions when I come to this text of 1 Peter chapter 1 is I can't believe that Peter wrote these things. I mean, if you're new to studying the Bible, this is Peter, one of the apostles, one of the 12 disciples of Jesus who become the founding apostles of the early church. But this, this is Peter who was the impulsive, uneducated fisherman. This is Peter who's first out of the boat and the first to sink. But this is Peter who Jesus once said, get behind me, Satan, when Peter had wrong-headed ideas about who Jesus was and what he was all about. This is Peter who made bold promises, loved to run his mouth and yet would deny Jesus three times. This guy wrote these words. It's astounding. Now, Peter would go on after the resurrection of Jesus and his ascension to heaven to become one of the key leaders in the early church, first in a city called Antioch and then in Rome. In fact, he became the bishop, the head of the church in Rome. 
And that's where he wrote this letter sometime between 62 and 64 A.D. And he's writing to Christians living in the northern part of Asia Minor. We'll see here an, a map of Asia Minor. This is modern-day Turkey. But Peter says he's writing to people living in Bithynia here, in Pontus, in Galatia, Cappadocia, and Asia. So Christians and small house churches in these regions, he's writing to all of them, who are dispersed. And we need to understand some historical context here, what's going on. They're scattered throughout this, this part of the world. They're facing uh, some persecution. You see, what happened is in 64 AD, in July of that year, there was a great fire in Rome, a massive fire that destroyed m- much of the city. Some historians speculate, though it's hard to prove, that Emperor Nero, the emperor of Rome, started the fire himself because he wanted to rebuild it in his own uh, designs for the whole city. Whether or not he lit the fire himself, he certainly blamed the Christians, this small religious sect from Judaism that was living uh, in Rome and in the Roman Empire. He blamed these Christians for the fire. And that sparked, (laughs) pun intended, a massive and vicious and brutal persecution over the next several years in the Roman Empire against Christians, which would culminate, quite frankly, in the Apostle Paul and Peter himself being arrested and eventually executed. So to be a follower of Jesus in this time, Peter's writing somewhere in the beginning or in the early stages in the midst of this persecution. To be a follower of Jesus at this time would have felt like the world's falling apart. It would have felt like everything's crashing down around you. In fact, this this region is the area where the Apostle Paul planted churches. And Paul either, he's been arrested, he's either been executed or is soon to be executed. So if you're living in that region, the very guy who started the movement in your region is, is dead or soon to be. You've become, Christianity has become enemy, public enemy number one in the Roman Empire. This would have been such a challenging, pressure-packed time to try to follow Jesus. The tension and pressure in their daily life must have been incredible. And this is the context in which Peter writes these amazing words. Let's look at verses 1 and 2 once more. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, the word apostle means sent one, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. We could spend a whole sermon series on these two verses, but I want to walk through a couple of words here that are really crucial for us to understand what Peter is saying. These are profoundly encouraging verses for people living in such a pressurized, tense situation. First, he says, you are elect exiles. The word elect means, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a very interesting Greek word. It means eklektos. It means chosen, preferred, favored. Uh, it, Paul in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 says that you are the, the chosen of God before the foundations of the world. So me, what he's saying to them is you're not forgotten by God. You're chosen by God. Maybe you grew up like I did in an era where you picked teams in the playground. I don't know. I don't think kids pick teams anymore. I think it's done by their parents and they're put in teams. But when I was a kid, we would make up our games and you pick teams. And nobody wants to be picked last. And remember that feeling when I remember one time with my buddy Adam, we're waiting, we're playing uh, touch football, uh, which turned into tackle football. But his older brother and his older brother's friend were picking teams and they picked us like before, the, before the, we were the last ones left. I felt so good. I got picked. I got chosen. That's kind of the image here. Peter's saying to these people who feel like they're forgotten, feel discarded, feel like God doesn't see and God doesn't know. And he's saying, you're, you're elect, you're favored, you're preferred, you're chosen. And then he says, exiles. This is a fascinating word. This is the Greek word, the um, parapodimos. And it means aliens, strangers, sojourners, resident aliens, living in a strange country. And this is the only place in the New Testament that puts these two Greek words right together. He's saying you're chosen to be resident aliens. You're you're preferred and chosen by God to live as sojourners in the land. Then he goes on and uses another word of the dispersion. This is the Greek word diaspora. 
It means scattered. The root word has to do with a, a, a farmer, a sower, scattering seed. Starting to get the picture here? You're chosen by God to live as sojourners in the world, scattered with purpose, with intent. The, the sower is sowing seed with the intent of it growing and producing something. You're not just thrown to the wind, like randomly. God's involved in this. God's working in this. And then one more word, according to the foreknowledge of God. This is the Greek word prognosis, where we get our word prognosis from. It means to know ahead of time, to see beforehand. Are you getting the picture here? These Christians, living under intense pressure, feeling like outcasts, Peter is saying right at the start, you're chosen, you're sent by God. It feels like you're scattered to the wind, but you're not. It's all happening according to the plan and knowledge of God. He has not forgotten you. He has not discarded you. He has not done with you. In fact, all of this is happening for purposes that God is in control of, though it may not feel like it to you right in this moment. What an incredible encouragement, even to us, to you, and to me, that you are chosen by God if you're in Christ. You are sent into your neighborhood, your community, your city, according to the foreknowledge of God, his purpose. We, we as his people, that's what we mean by every house, a chapel on its street, in our name, Chapel Street, we're, we're scattered like seeds by, uh, from the sower's hand into our communities. It was true in the first century, and it's true to, for us in the 21st century. I, one of the things I love about the Bible in general with this passage is that the Bible's not escapism. It's not making false promises. It's not burying its head in the sand and ignoring the pain and difficulty of, of everyday life. It's realistic and it's hopeful. One more thing here in these verses. Notice uh, that Peter anchors their hope in the Trinity. He says, according to God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ the Son. Right there, you've got this Trinitarian grounding of their hope. It's incredible, isn't it? Again, we could spend a lot more time on this, but we need to keep moving. So Peter's whole aim here is not to get them out of their present difficulties, but to ground them in Christ, in their hope, in the midst of them. And we're going to look at the rest of the, of the passage, and there's five characteristics of hope I want to outline. Let's look at verses 3 through 5 once more in the text. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again into a living hope. There's the title of our series and the central image of this text. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded. I want you to notice these words, kept and guarded. By God's power, through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Okay, first characteristic is living hope. It's living hope. Peter is locating our lives and theirs into a greater story. Human beings, we have this tendency to, we, to create stories or uh, if we... If, you know, discover stories, write stories, create stories, but that give meaning to our lives and shape to our lives. You look back over the mythologies and the stories that shape every culture and every era of history, and what are they doing? They're Norse mythology, right? Celtic mythology, Greek mythology, stories that give shape and meaning to their experience of the world. In fact, uh, Lewis calls Christ the Christian story the true myth. It's the story that is behind all stories. And when you get hints of the gospel and of these other mythologies, it's really pointing back to the true myth. But we do this naturally because we're longing for hope. We're, by nature, hopeful creatures. We need to find some story in which we can have hope. Viktor Frankl, in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, talking about those who survived and endured uh, best during the Holocaust when they were in Nazi concentration camps, were those that had a grander vision of their hope that was beyond their present circumstances. So what Peter's doing is he's trying for these Christians in the first century and for us to anchor them in, their, in the hope in Christ, in the bigger, grander, greater story of what God is doing. It's a living hope. That means it's not longing for some distant past, like I wish we could go back to those days, nor is it some vague notion of what may happen in the future. 
but it's present and living alive right now. You and I are shaped by our understanding of the future. Or to put it another way, how we live in the present has everything to do with how we understand our future. That's what it means to have a living hope. A picture, an image, an understanding of the future that gives us life and, and meaning in the present. And in fact, Peter says that we're born again into it. That it's a living hope because we're born into it. That it, it's not something that we concoct or make up or uh, you know, invent. It's something that happens to us. The German theologian Jürgen Moltmann puts it this way. Christian faith isn't just a conviction, a feeling, or a decision. It invades life so deeply that we have to talk about dying and being born again, which is what corresponds to the death and resurrection of Christ. This idea of being born again is central to this image, the idea of hope. In fact, in John chapter 3, Jesus has this fascinating encounter with the Pharisee, a religious teacher named Nicodemus. As a matter of fact, if you've never seen the, uh, the online show series called the Chosen, it's fantastic. I would encourage you to get the app and you can watch that. Uh, it's the, the life of Christ and it's calling the disciples. They do a beautiful depiction of this encounter between Jesus and Nicodemus. Nicodemus, though he's one of the Pharisees, he's one of the good ones, one of the, the, the re religious ruling council, he comes to Jesus and he wants to know about the kingdom. And Jesus says, we can't even have this conversation unless you're born again. You need a whole new life to even begin to understand what the kingdom is all about. So it's a hope that invades your life and completely takes over, changes you. It's a living hope. Second, it's a certain hope. Peter is talking about the certainty of the future for those who have this living hope. For, for the Christian, these really are not uncertain times. We hear that all, all the time, right? These uncertain times, these unprecedented times. I saw a joke, a meme on, on social media a while back that said, I, I long for precedented times. But for the Christ follower, for those that know this living hope, these are not unprecedented times. They're not uncertain times because we have a certainty that runs far deeper than present circumstances might make us feel. Look at the words he uses again. If we could, go, I'll just go to my t the Bible. We won't be on the screen. But if you look at the words he uses here, he says, into a living hope, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. Imperishable, undefiled, unfading. Talk about certainty. And then he says, it's kept in heaven for you who are being guarded by the power of God. What could be more certain? What could be more rock solid that God's power is keeping, guarding you and preserving for you an inheritance that nothing can touch? The, the NASDAQ, the Dow Jones, your 401k, election cycles, nothing can touch it. It's imperishable, undefiled, unfading. You are being guarded by the power of God. Do you know that? You believe that? Think about that for a minute. Who or what is guarding your life? Who's keeping your hope? If your hope is in the economy or in money, who's keeping that? Who's guaranteeing that? If your hope is in your career, who's guaranteeing that? If your hope is in your family, who's protecting and guarding that? But if your hope is in Christ, it is 100% guarantee. It is a certainty Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19 says, we have this hope, living hope, as an anchor for our souls, firm and secure. The anchor only does any good if it goes all the way down to the bottom and grabs on, right? That's the image. This hope that runs deep, holds fast. It's a sure thing. Let's look at verses 6 through 7 again. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Look at this. Notice what Peter does here. He puts rejoice and grieved by trials in the same context. 
There it is. They're, they're, they're suffering. They're being tested. They're going through some stuff. There's some pressure. This is suffering hope. Suffering hope. Peter is telling us what hope looks like under fire. What does hope, what's its character? What does it look like when hope, is, when hope suffers? Present rejoicing and present grief in trials. We, we assume it's got to be one or the other. Either I'm rejoicing or I'm grieving. I can't be doing both. How can you be rejoicing and grieving at the same time? That only makes sense if you understand this living hope. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, the Apostle Paul says, We do not grieve like those who have no hope. There's a depth of rejoicing that runs underneath. Even our grief, it undergirds it. It holds us in the midst of it. Gospel hope, living hope, makes it possible for us to be rejoicing and grieving, to be trusting and rejoicing in God and facing trial. I sat in the family room with a friend who had just lost his wife to a battle with cancer, and his children and grandchildren were there. And you could feel both the deep grief of the trial and the suffering and the pain, and at the same time, this undergirding hope that they shared in Christ. Both were present. Both were palpable in the room. Suffering hope. Because our hope is not located in our present circumstances. We, we, we tend to think in this culture that suffering somehow is a sign that something's wrong. That if we suffer and if we go through trials, that, that what that means is that God has left us or has you know, removed himself from us. But actually, the biblical authors say exactly the opposite. They say suffering is not the absence of God. It's not evidence of the absence of God. In fact, it can be the absence of his. Pre- it can be the evidence of his presence. In in Acts chapter five, the Peter and John and some of the apostles are arrested for preaching the gospel after Jesus' death and, and resurrection, and they're warned you not to preach in his name. They're beaten and and uh, tortured for preaching in his name, and then they're released. And when they're released, Peter and John and the other apostles are praising God. You know why? Because they were counted worthy to suffer for the name. They saw their suffering not as a sign that God was absent, but that they were identified with him. How different is that from our American sensibilities? Very, isn't it so different? I, I struggle with this too. We, we live in a culture that's conditioned to think comfort, security, ease is what we should be going after. That's a sign that God is with us, prosperity and comfort. But it's not true. It's not even good for us. I mean, look at this quote from C.S. Lewis in his uh, famous work called The Screwtape Letters. This is an excerpt from the 28th letter. Now, if you don't know about Screwtape Letters, Screwtape is the fictional character of a demon writing to his nephew named Wormwood. Demons don't have nephews. They don't write letters. But Lewis is using this as an imaginary understanding of how evil forces work in our lives. And Wormwood is in charge of a patient, meaning a human being, a man. And he's excited because it's World War II and this man might die from the bombings in, in Great Britain. And Screwtape writes and say, no, no, we don't want him to die. Here's what he writes. They, meaning God and, and, the, and his forces of good, of course, do tend to regard death as the prime evil uh, and survival as the greatest good. But that is because we have taught them to do so. So human beings tend to regard death as the worst possible thing. But that's because death, the forces of evil have taught them to believe that. If he dies now, you lose him. Prosperity knits a man to the world. He feels that he is finding his place in it, while really it is finding his place in him. The truth is that the enemy, and by the way, the enemy means God, having oddly destined these mere animals to life in his own eternal world, has guarded them pretty effectively from the danger of feeling at home anywhere else. Resident aliens, right? Elect exiles. Whatever you do, keep your patient as safe as you possibly can. That's the last line of this chapter, and it's haunting to me. One demon says to another, whatever you do, keep your patient, keep that person as safe and as comfortable and as secure as you possibly can. Safety, comfort, security is not always good for your soul. It's not the best thing for you. You feel that? Peter says it in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Beloved, 
Don't be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Peter says, this is not, why are you surprised? We're not guaranteed a, a, a peaceful, easy, secure life. That's not what God promises. He promises us living hope and presence and strength in the midst of the trial. Now, I, I don't know if you have noticed this phrase in verse 6. And I had not really paid attention to this before. Listen to this phrase. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. The word various trials, the word various means many colored, many different kinds of trials. Some are losses and, 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 and death and sorrow. Some are a persecution. Some are deep disappointments uh, and relational tensions. All kinds of trials. But the phrase, if necessary, struck me as I was studying this passage this week. If necessary. The Greek word is deon. It means uh, some, that which is needful. And the translation actually, it's not asking if it's, if it's necessary. It's saying it is necessary. It's needful in your life. John Newton, who wrote the great hymn Amazing Grace and was a slave trader before he was converted to faith in Christ and worked for uh, abolition of slavery in, in, in Europe and in Great Britain. In uh, one of his great works, he wrote this, Everything is needful that he sends. And nothing can be needful that he, God, withholds. If you think about that, that's a hard truth to swallow. Everything in my life that God allows or sends is, is needed. It's necessary. It's not random. Nothing in my life that God withholds can be necessary for me or needful. How many of us are stuck thinking, if I, I need this, if I just had this, I need this. And we're focused on what we think we need that we don't have. And the truth is, you have what you need. And some of the things that you need aren't necessarily things that are comfortable or secure or easy. In fact, sometimes there are various many colored trials that are necessary in our lives. They're actually needed to produce something. How often have I thought, nothing good can come from this? How often have I been wrong? So I, let me just ask this question. What, what weakness, what brokenness is in you that God is trying to reveal and refine during your trial? I mean, you could make the case that the last year has been a trial of varying degrees for, for our entire nation, for the world. Maybe you felt that in different ways. What area of your character is God revealing and refining through this season? I've talked to moms who never wanted to be a, a homeschool mom, never wanted to help have to tutor their kids at home, but now they're at home with little ones on, trying to learn on Zoom, and they find themselves in a trial that they're ill-equipped for, wondering, how am I going to get through this? Or men who have lost jobs or are working from home. Or if, uh, I talked to one man who said he didn't lose a job, but his, his company laid off dozens and he was the one who had to tell all of them. And it put him in a depression. What trial are you going through that you're thinking, I don't, th this can't be needed in my life. And maybe God is saying, there is something I want to do in you through it. There is, it is necessary to produce in you something you could not get otherwise. You know what, for me, one of those challenges is this. I love people. I'm an extroverted person by nature. I love uh, communicating God's truth to real, living, breathing people. I never thought I'd be preaching to a camera for a better part of a year, but that's what I've been doing. And I've struggled with that. I was frustrated, like, well, this is no good. This isn't the same thing. And it's as if God has been teaching me over and over again, hey, Jeff, it's always been an audience of one. I've always been your audience. And maybe I've forgotten that and drifted in, uh, away from that and need to be reminded of that. doesn't mean everything that comes from the trial is good, but it means there's something God can do in the midst of it. And this brings us to the, the next aspect of hope, a proven hope. A proven hope. Notice in verse 7, Peter says, the tested genuineness of your faith. The tested genuineness. Is your faith real? Is your faith genuine? I'll put it this way. God knows what kind of faith you have. Do you? One of the ways we discover that is by going through some things, by struggling, by suffering, by facing the trial with him. 
Something is being produced in us. You are gaining something through this trial that you cannot get without it. I read a book called At the Lion's Gate. It's a story of the Six-Day War uh, in Israel, um, between Israel, Egypt, and, and Syria and Jordan written from the point of view of the uh, freedom fighters on the ground. And there's a section in there where Ariel Sharon says that uh, courage is not something you have prior to going into battle. Courage is something you get after going through it. Speaking to young freedom fighters who are going to battle for the first time. Courage is not something that you have and you, oh, I better pull up my courage now, muster it up and create it. That's not actually how it works. It's generated or created in you once you have gone through the fire. Spiritually speaking, the same thing is true. Peter's saying, the tested genuineness of your faith, something is going on inside of you. This can either make you or break you. Turn to your living hope. Seek him. Ask him what he wants to do in your life in the midst of it. Wouldn't it be nice, though, if we could just learn all the important lessons in life by a 30-minute sermon, take a few notes and apply it? It'd be nice, wouldn't it? Life doesn't work that way, does it? No, it doesn't. God is purifying and refining. And you know, you know, I think right now in our cultural moment, there's a lot of talk and, and articles being written and people pontificating about the, the waning of the Christian influence in our nation, the loss of religious freedom, Christianity being marginalized and being conflated with political ideology and the church losing its influence. And there's lots of sociologists on both sides debating this and hand-wringing and being fearful. But I think perhaps if we step back, maybe God is at work. And there's a refining going on. There's a sifting going on, a purifying going on. That's the image Peter uses here, gold refined in fire. It has to go through the fire to be purified. Maybe God wants to burn some things off of the church in America, of your life and of mine. Maybe God wants to burn away the shallow, consumeristic, weak, Americanized version of Christianity. That's, you know, it's all about attraction, it's all about the surface. When if, uh, uh, we could debate what, what the greatest Rocky movie is of all time, but I think it's really not up for debate. It's Rocky 1. And then maybe we could have a debate about what the next great Rocky movie is, but it's really not up for debate. It's Rocky 3. In case you're wondering, there you have it on good authority. Rocky 1 and then Rocky 3. Rocky 3 is uh, he's, he's facing Clubber Lang, Mr. T. You know? And Mickey, Rocky's trainer, there's this poignant scene when he refuses to train him because he doesn't think Rocky can win. And Rocky says, why? What are you talking about? And Mickey says... The worst thing that could happen to any fighter has happened to you, Rock. You got civilized. That's my best Mickey impersonation. You got civilized. I think there's a sense in which perhaps the American version of Christianity and the church in our culture today has been domesticated, has been softened, has been, to quote Mickey, civilized. Christianity was never meant to be this safe thing. It's a movement, a world-shaping, life-transforming, history-altering, quite frankly, dangerous movement that has outlasted the great Roman Empire and all empires. And the gospel is still alive today in parts of the world that are very unlike America. Recently, I had a chance to talk to a missionary friend who was telling me stories uh, about his work in a Muslim country where it's actually illegal to be a missionary and where he's struggling to begin to plant churches and let people know the hope of the gospel, remarkable stories of God's work. He told me this story of a young man who converted from Islam to faith in Jesus and felt the call of God to be an evangelist, trained in evangelism and was bold in sharing his faith and wanted to go to a different neighboring country. But because his name was on a list... The, he, uh, as an evangelist, he couldn't get in, but he felt God calling him. And even the missionary agent said, you know, you really probably ought not to do that. It's not safe. And he said, I feel like God is calling me. I have to do this. So if, after three failed attempts, he finally got into the country. But after a few months, he was arrested by a Muslim militia, interrogated, tortured, and died of his injuries. When this missionary friend was telling me this story, I, I was so moved with grief And I said, I'm so, so sorry for your loss. Because they were dear friends. And he said, oh, thank you. It was tragic and it was hard. And then he said these words. He says, but you know, it is a privilege to be a part of what God is doing there. It's a privilege. And he said, actually, Pastor Jeff, sometimes we feel sorry for you in America. Can you imagine that? 
He's telling me a story about someone who lost his life for his faith. And I said, I'm sorry. And he said, actually, sometimes I feel sorry for you. Because you don't know, perhaps, the intense joy and passion and faith of putting it all on the line like that. Christianity started as a movement worth dying for. And maybe what Peter's saying to the church in Asia Minor and to the church today is that there's something being tested when you face the trial, proving its genuineness. How deep does this go? Is this worth dying for? Is this your life? And the result, Peter says, of all of this is praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The goal is not personal glory, personal praise, personal honor. It's praise and honor to Jesus. Let's look at the last couple of verses. Though you have not seen him, you love him. This is fascinating to me. You've not seen him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him. So there's still possibility to have love and belief and faith, though we don't see him. And rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Verse 8 is one of my favorite verses in this passage. There's so many great ones, but it, Peter says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him. Now, this is Peter who wrote this, who had seen Jesus before and after his resurrection. Peter had the moment in John chapter 21 where Jesus, after the resurrection, reinstates Peter for his, he asked him three questions to heal his three denials and reinstate him back into the family, as it were. Peter had seen Jesus in the flesh before and after the resurrection, but he's writing to Christians who'd never seen him. Not, not physically. He's writing to people like you and me. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you have not now seen him, you believe in him. Here's the point, friends. It's possible to have the same faith as Peter. Jesus is no less real and present to you and to me than he was to Peter and to those first Christians. We don't think that's true, but the Bible's saying it is true. He's no less real. He's no less present, no less powerful in our lives. And this is the final point, rejoicing hope. Rejoicing hope. This living hope produces a deep joy, a deep down delight that is beyond words. It's beyond our capacity to explain it. It, it, No trial or struggle in this life can ever take it away and ever diminish it. And Jonathan Edwards, when he was 18 years old, uh, his very first sermon, it was on the nature of Christian joy. He, he writes, here's what he writes. He gives three reasons for the Christian happiness or joy. He says, number one, our bad things will turn out for good. Even the trial we face, God is doing something in the midst of it and will redeem it and produce something in us we could not get another way. Number two, our good things cannot be taken away from us. So the, the, the good things in our lives, ultimately speaking, can't be taken away because they don't belong to us or this world. They belong to Christ. And number three, most important, our best things are yet to come. He wrote that when he was 18 years old. How profoundly true is that? We rejoice with joy that is inexpressible, filled with glory. Why? Because our good things, our our bad things turn out for good. And our good things can't be taken away. And most of all, our best things are yet to come. Where the best moment of your life the moment when you felt most at home in this world, the moment most full of joy and satisfaction and fulfillment with your family on a mountaintop, watching the sunrise at the beach, whatever it is, your best moments are just tiny, imperfect glimpses of what awaits you. They're nothing compared to what awaits us. Our best things are yet to come. This is our living hope. And verse 9, we're told that all of this is to produce the salvation of your souls. Let me put it to you this way. The main purpose of your life and my life, of our life in this world, is to prepare us for the next one. What we're facing right now, what we're going through right now, what we experience right now is not ultimate. It's not. It's a fraction of eternity. What awaits us is far beyond this. And so our life now, going through whatever we face, is meant to prepare us for an eternity of glory. I mean, Isn't it amazing what Peter writes to these Christians 
on the, on the threshold of intense persecution. I don't know what the future holds for the coronavirus, for the pandemic, for the economy, for my own life. I don't know what it holds for your life. But I do know this. Peter is saying, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has caused us to be born again into a living hope by his great mercy through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That is the truth we hold on to. That is our living hope. Let's pray. Father God, as we we have just scratched the surface of these remarkable words written so long ago to people struggling to follow you and to hold on to hope, Lord God, let these words resonate in our hearts, sink down from our minds into our souls. God, we know that we're facing different kinds of trials, many colored trials. And Lord, teach us by your mercy and the power of your spirit to trust that you're at work in them. You have something for us in them, even the darkest places, even the hardest things we face, that you can use them. You may not cause them, but you're bringing about your purposes through them. Teach us to trust that, Lord, and to look to you, to let the anchor of our hope in your son Jesus run down deep and take hold and hold us fast, even in the storms. And God, help us as a church to recover the vitality of this living hope and this faith. Forgive us for our consumeristic and selfish and and weak mindsets. Lord, remind us daily that the best thing for us is not our own personal comfort or security, but it's you, it's always you. So refine us, Lord God, we pray, as we go through this journey in this letter to 1 Peter. Shape us into the kind of people you want us to be, people characterized by a living hope in you, Jesus. We pray in your name. Amen. Well, thanks again for tuning in and for joining us online. Stay tuned now for a few uh, little bits of information about what's happening in our church family.